All right. Uh, so welcome everybody to our November meeting of Gensel PowerShell User Group. Uh, this is a talk, uh, I call it Building Your First PowerShell Script. And it's really just sort of an illustration of, uh, I, I think, uh, a lot of the, the journey that I went through in going from the very first learning of PowerShell to trying to build better, more reusable scripts that I could hand off to people without having to say, oh yeah, this works this way, and oh yeah, and you can't do that over there, and uh, and watch out for this. If you put it in that way, it doesn't work right. Uh, so it's really um, kind of stepping through, going from uh, just having maybe a command line or two uh, that you come up with that is useful, uh, and, and then kind of expanding that out to using it against multiple machines, uh, wrapping it up uh, uh, with uh, parameters and things so you can pass it off to your team, uh, and then adding documentation, logging, things like that. Make it something that uh, you can actually post on the internet and uh, and be proud of. Um, so uh, I sort of started up with a scenario of uh, we've been tasked with gathering you know manufacturer models, serial number of computers in our environment, um, and we figured out that get CIM instance. Well, I can do this. Um, I do recommend using get CIM instance because uh, get to be my object is actually technically deprecated. Um, starting in PowerShell 3, the help for get to be my object, I actually recommend using get CIM instance instead. Um, the only gotcha with get CIM instance is it does require that you have PowerShell remoting enabled, but that is the path forward. And actually, I was testing last week uh, in PowerShell 7, and I realized that get to be my object actually doesn't exist in PowerShell 7. So um, if, you know, if you're thinking about building scripts for the future, uh, which we all should be thinking about, um, try doing get CIM instance. Um, so I start out with these two commands, uh, and all we're doing is querying WMI, the Win32 computer system class, and the Win32 BIOS class um, to get the information we're looking for. Right. If we run these individually, sorry, that's right. so that produces, you know, our manufacturer, our model, and the name of the machine, and this should produce our serial number which in a VM is maybe a little less interesting than otherwise it would be, but. Default hover, drag on more. There, there we go, all right. F8 will also uh, Awesome, that's true, thank you. Um, yeah, that's another thing. Uh, so as I'm going through, feel free to ask questions, uh, give me feedback, tell me I'm doing things wrong because uh, this is as much a learning opportunity for me as it is for you. Hopefully everybody gets something out of it. Um, and if I get something out of it, that'd be great too. So uh, as I said, you know, if you run those commands individually, that you know, kind of gives you what you're looking for. Uh, but we'll notice if we run it as a script, uh, we actually only get half of the output. Um, and the reason for that is, is actually this is a bug or, or this is a, a feature, I guess. Uh, um, PowerShell formats uh, for the properties that are in the first uh, object that gets returned. And since serial number isn't a property that's in the first object, there it's there, but you can't see it. So uh, for this to actually work, we have to do FL star, um, which is less than ideal. And we're gonna talk about how we can fix that in a little bit. Um, but so that that's when we run the script that is actually returning everything we're looking for. Um, so the first improvement uh, I look at, if you notice here, we've got computer name uh, on the, each of the commands, and it's hard coded to localhost. Uh, and in a script where we've only got two commands, that's really you know if you had to change that, not really a big deal. You can go through and change it in two places. Find and replace is great, um, but it would be ideal if you're talking about using this kind of a, or sharing this with the team is replacing that with a variable. So the first improvement and kind of step that I started to make, I think, as I started learning how to do PowerShell was stop hard coding your computer names uh, into the commandlets and start using a variable for them or, or whatever it is that you're looking at. You know, whether it's computer name, uh, you know, directories, things like that. Uh, put that stuff in a, in a variable at the top of your script uh, so it's easy to find and you change it one place and it gets propagated out through the entire uh, script. So that's you know really simple. We just uh, basically take the local host out, put in the variable for computer name, and then create the variable computer name up here and set it to whatever the host name we're looking at is. 
right? And then if I want to change this to from localhost to PC1 and run it, you know, then I get that the information from DC1. Notice I'm still missing that serial number because I didn't run it with it else with the uh, format list. Um, so let's see if we can uh, improve something a little bit better. Um, so next step is, is if we're going to the trouble of putting that computer name up there, um, wouldn't it be great if we could actually take the computer name as input from the command line, right? So when we run our script, instead of having to open it up and change the computer name every time we run it, um, let's take it as a parameter from the command line. So when we run it, we say, and just ask for a computer name. And that's really low down there. I'm sorry, that's a little bit hard to see. Um, so if we do this, then we can do computer name and DC one for a remote computer. And if I put that to there we go right so that's better right so now we can basically don't have to actually open up the script uh, to change the name we're doing it from the from the command line um, another thing about doing parameters is we can get these sort of uh, arguments and uh, things that basically help us to make sure that we're getting the input that we're expecting, right? So, uh, for instance, we have, there's a number of these and you can pull up the uh, help for advanced functions, or functions and advanced parameters. This here, the get help about advanced, func about functions, advanced parameters. Um, has a whole list of all of the options you can include here, but basically, uh, we've set a mandatory equals true. That means the parameter is mandatory. And we've set a help message. Um, now the help message varies where it shows up depending on where you're running the script from. Uh, if we're running it in uh, power, the PowerShell uh, console, We run it without a parameter. It's going to prompt us for the computer name. And you'll notice right here it says type exclamation point question mark for help. So if we do that, that's where that help message shows up. Um, not incredibly helpful, but if you're in this environment, if you're going to be running it from the, the uh, console, then it it's, you know, obviously can be useful. Um, in VS Code, as far as I can tell, it doesn't show up anywhere. Um, there's no way to pull that. Um, you can also do things like uh, do positional parameters. So if you don't want to actually have to enter the uh, dash computer name, you can say that this is the uh, position zero parameter. And then you could just put uh, the, the, uh, the script name followed by dc1.corp.contoso.com and it would automatically realize that this was the computer name. Um, and uh, run as it's supposed to. Um, there's a bunch of other things you can do there. Like I said, checking, check that um, uh, conceptual help file uh, for more information on what options are there. Really, really helpful stuff. Um, the other thing you can do is actually do some validation of the input. So uh, here I put in uh, validate set, and this basically says, this is probably why I was having a, an error earlier. Um, this basically says that whatever host name I put in has to be either localhost, app1.corp.contesto.com, or dc1.corp.contesto.com. Um, so I put those in just to demonstrate that, uh, that that's some of the possibilities. Uh, but actually, when I run it, the other thing you can do uh, when you have a validate set in there is you can actually tab complete between the three or whatever you have in the validate set. Um, so you don't actually type anything in, you just tap between the options. Um, so that's handy if you have a certain set of options you're going to use, you know, if you're doing, uh, you know, either uh, you're picking colors and you're saying, you know, I've got red, green, or blue, um, you know, you put those in a validate set 
and no one's going to enter blue spelled wrong or you know or or green uh, if that's not an option. Um, so uh, the other thing we do here when we set the parameter is uh, we tell it what kind what type of object the parameter is going to be. So in this case, our computer name is a string. Um, that's basically uh, just a collection of uh, letters, numbers, characters, etc. Um, and basically, you know, anything that you're going to bring in that's just a series of text is going to come into the string. You can bring it in as an integer, uh, you know, there's any number of different data types there as well. Um, but a lot of the time, you're just going to use a string, and PowerShell is pretty intelligent about figuring out uh, what things are and how to use them. So, um, you can also include multiple parameters here. So if we wanted to add another one here, uh, just do a comma and then uh, kind of mimic what's already here. Uh, so I was looking at that and to command the binding uh, makes your function an advanced function. As does uh, having this parameter uh, uh, block in here. I did. I learned it today. Actually, I learned it today <laughs> because I was trying to figure out why I didn't have it in my my uh, my script when I ran this previously. Uh, so, so I said, you know, "What is it getting me?" And I said, "It's not getting me anything. Why is it not getting me anything?" Oh, because it's already an advanced function. Um, so once you put in a parameter. That turns this into an advanced function. And advanced functions basically get, are able to take advantage of the common parameters like verbose and what if and things like that. Um, so you typically, anytime you're writing uh, a script, you can either include a uh, command line binding, which is Yeah, I got that right. Uh, including that turns this into an advanced function and gets you all of those things for free, or having a parameter, either one um, or both. It doesn't hurt to have both. So, uh, so again, if we're adding another parameter, we just uh, we can copy that literally. There's a comma after the last one, and we say, you know, this is computer name too. Right? The only thing that uh, PowerShell cares about in this case. Is that computer the, the variable names are different? So. so if we save this, then you know, here I can do computer name too, and it's asking for it there. So. Okay, so so this is getting better. It looks you know kind of you're doing things from the command line now. You're not having to open the script every time. But you know that we still have that issue where where the uh, the full output doesn't output unless you use this format list command at the end of it. And that's that's no good. So we're going to solve that by creating a PowerShell object uh, made up of all the properties that we're looking for, and then output that object instead. Okay. So this is the part of the script we were just talking about. So here's our parameters, just like we had just had. Uh, here's our commands that we're running to get all the information. And what I've done is instead of running those ad hoc, I'm setting them to a variable. So the uh, results out of Win32 computer system are going into a variable called computer system, and the results out of uh, Win32 BIOS are going into the BIOS variable. So then I'm going to make a hash table uh, to contain all of the properties we're interested in. Right? And basically, what this can what this ends up doing is we create a property and a value uh, that is going to be in the PowerShell object. So we're interested in the manufacturer. Uh, and this is the, the property that's going to show up in the object we create. And then this is the value we're going to assign to it. It's going to be computer system dot manufacturer. Okay, so we're pulling it right out of that the results of the get CIM instance command. Same with the model, your computer system dot model. The name is the computer name that we already had um, that, that we're pulling in from the command line from our parameter. And then the BIOS or the serial number is coming out of the, the BIOS result. Okay. So create, we create this hash table. And part of the reason for doing it this way, uh, we could just as easily uh, take the hash table and add it uh, as a value on property here. 
but this makes it much more readable if you would notice. And you know, one thing to note when you make PowerShell scripts um, is that if you can make it more readable, you make it easier on yourself when you go back to edit these again another time or when someone else comes back behind you, the more readable this is, the easier it is for me for somebody to understand. If you have, uh, you know, have a real long line that's you know, uh, scrolling up a page by three times, it, that's hard to kind of unravel and figure out what you're doing. When you use your line wraps uh, and you know, format your uh, hash tables and, and other loops and things uh, in a way that basically you, you know, start the, the curly bracket on one line, move down to the next line, move down to the next line, and then close it on the next line, it's very easy to see where this opens and closes and finishes. <clears throat> so from there, uh, we're gonna, this is how we create a new PowerShell object. So we just use the new object command and we're going to tell it it's a type the type of object we're creating is a ps object powershell object and these are the properties we want of it and it's going to be just these properties here so now when we run this create a computer name we have a power, this is a powershell object that contains all the properties we're interested in and we could do we could also Pipe this to get member. That tells us all the properties that are there. So here's all the properties that we wanted, just this, what, what's being displayed. And here we can see the type of object it is. It's PS custom object. So this is a good way to take, if you have information coming in from different sources, uh, maybe you're querying a database for some information, you're querying Active Directory for other information, you want to put it all together and deliver uh, something that sort of describes a computer object or describes a user or something of that nature. Uh, this is a good way to tie it all together uh, into one object. Um, once you have one object, then that makes it easier for you to do things like sorting uh, and operating on that object's uh, sorting, uh, filtering, all of that stuff will happen a little easier if you've got it all, all the things that are related to that object together in one PowerShell object. Make sense, any questions? Yes, custom object type accelerator. I have not. Oh, I'll show you. Okay. Which is basically kind of compresses that. You don't need the new object. Okay. Instead of properties equals, mm -hmm. you can leave that and just put PS custom object and then type in brackets. Sure. It will automatically output a custom object using the hash tool. Really? Yeah. That sounds amazing. Nice. It's nice. It's kind yeah. of like a clever way of doing it. Sure. Nice. So, mentioning that, that sounds like a really great uh, shortcut and it works well. Um, but one thing I do a lot, um, because I do have, I work in a team and I pass around my scripts a lot, is I'll often make sure I use uh, full commandlet names and full parameter names. Because again, when someone, maybe junior or even, you know, even not junior, coming behind you to try and figure out what your script does or how it's doing what it does. Um, because, you know, oftentimes somebody knows what your script does or what it's supposed to do. Uh, but it's more interesting about how does it actually happen. And unraveling all of that is a lot easier if you're using full command line names and full parameter names, um, because when they pull up the help or they, you know, uh, you know, try to figure out what a command line is, um, you know, that that it's easier to to understand when you're using those full command line parameter names. So um, definitely, shortcuts have a lot of have a have a place. Um, I use them quite a bit in a lot of places, but in places that, like I said, scripts that I'm going to pass along to folks, I always try to use the full command line parameter names. So this is looking pretty good. We've got a PowerShell object getting output. You know, all the information is together in, in one object. Uh, you know, this is something we could probably pass off pretty well. And, you know, people would say, oh, this is a great tool. You, you know, you make PowerShell objects, that's great. Um, and then someone would come back and say, this is great, but uh, it does one computer at a time. And I wanna get this information from my entire department. Or I have 20 machines I wanna grab this on at one time. And you go, hmm, all right. So then you go back to the drawing board, right? And you say, all right, well, how do I do that? So but there's a couple of changes. It's actually not that bad. It's uh, quite easy, actually. So the first thing we're going to change is that if you remember previously, when we were pulling in our parameter, it was a string, right? And a string is just one thing. You can only have one, uh, one, one string. But in PowerShell, when you take a, uh, a type and you put two square brackets after it, this, that makes it an array. So now we're taking an array of strings, which means we can have multiple strings with multiple computer names, right? 
And the way we do that is we, uh, when, when the, we enter them on the command line, we're gonna separate them with a comma. So from there, we're gonna take and run uh, a for each loop on the computers that we bring in. So right here, we're doing for each, and I like to use uh, descriptive variable names. Again, this helps to kind of unravel what's going on. So I say for each computer in computer name. Computer name is our parameter that we're pulling in. And so for each computer, we're gonna run these steps. Um, I've changed the variable uh, within each of the commands to computer because now we're not referencing computer name, right? We're referencing the computer because computer name is a collection of all those computer names. Okay. <clears throat> and I've changed it in the, uh, the place that it's referenced here in the, uh, in the properties. So I have one, two, three, four, five changes, right? And now we can do I want to run that, it runs, and this is returning three separate PowerShell objects, okay? So say we want to do things like sorting. We can sort on the serial number. We're gonna sort by the name. We want to uh, uh, filter by the name. We can do, uh, Right. And so all that's possible because we're actually looking at a PowerShell object. It's made easier. So. Questions so far? Yeah. Uh, can we go and get a copy of the script so we can look at all that? Yeah. Um, Thanks for coming. Yeah, no worries. Yeah, thanks for coming. Nice to meet you. Thank you. Absolutely, nice to meet you. Uh, sorry about that. So I'll uh, include a link to the uh, code in the meeting notes uh, later on as well. Uh, so now we've got multiple computer support. That's pretty good. All right. Um, but what happens when, you know, inevitably, uh, somebody their machines turned off, or someone puts in the wrong machine name, and then we get this, right? So those are pretty, all of our pretty output. And then we have this, this terrible, terrible red text. Um, so we need some error handling, right? <clears throat> so the way uh, we can do some error handling is with uh, try catch blocks. Um, and so basically, again, the parameters haven't changed. Uh, we still have our for each here, uh, but when we get down here to the uh, get CIM instance commands, we're gonna wrap those in a try block. Basically, if the computer isn't reachable, if somebody you know puts in the wrong computer name, or uh, you know the computer's turned off, or there's some other issue, uh, there may, you know maybe a WMI issue. But in this case, we're going to treat any issue where uh, the machine's not reachable as you know, the machine is offline. Okay. So the first thing we have to do is in our commands that could be causing an error, where we expect an error to happen. So in this case, in the get CIM instance commands. We need to tell them to have the error action of stop. Most of the time, your error action 
will be uh, uh, continue. And when that happens, the error spits out, and then this command the uh, uh, script continues. We want the script to stop and th uh, throw an error. And when that happens, the script will go down into the catch block. So, um, so we're going to put that error action on both of those. And the other thing we've done is in the properties hash table, we've added this uh, new property called status. And in the try block, if we're in the try block. That means that all, both of these commands have completed successfully. If they complete successfully, then we're going to say the computer is online. Okay. And if that happens, then it goes down to the finally block and creates the PowerShell object uh, just as it did previously. Now, if, it, either, if the computer is not online, if the commands don't run successfully in the error, then they're going to go immediately down to the catch block. And what we do in the catch block so that our output is the same is we create a hash table with the same properties as we do in the try block. So we've got a manufacturer, model, name, serial number, and status. For the manufacturer model and serial number, those are all the properties we were deriving from those commands that didn't run. We're going to set those to null. We're going to set the name to computer because we already knew that. And we're going to say that the status for that computer is offline. And again, the finally block runs regardless. Uh, it's whatever runs after the try or catch block, whichever one runs. So if we do this. So our output changed a little bit uh, for a couple of reasons. One, uh, let's see, let's see a little better. Because we went to five properties in our object, it now by default does format list instead of format table. Okay. So that's why it's showing in a list, but the output is the same. And you notice that on the first two, we got localhost is online, app one is online, but this DC2 that I entered is offline. Now, if I ran this, uh, I did. I forced it to format table. Again, you notice that all the properties line up still, but the derived properties that we were going to get from those commands just show up as empty. Um, and again, this is good so we can do some filtering. We can say uh, sort by status. Right. Or filter and say right, and this will just return our machines that were offline. So if we want to go and troubleshoot, why didn't why were the machines offline? Or you know, here's the we want to filter out the offline machines from the report we're giving to the boss. Uh, we can filter those out and just return the machines that are online. So, so you did online. This kind of thing for a huge script, right? Maybe output everything to CSV and everything from the data run. Yeah. And then you can kind of just sort through all the results as if they were objects. Yeah. So you can do sure if you uh, if you did. So you ran this, and then you want to output to a CSV. You could do export CSV and give it a path. CSV. All right, and as Andrew said, you know maybe this takes a day or two to run, a couple hours. And you come back a while later. And you say, let's uh, import that CSV. And then
Right. So yeah, it's totally valid and a great use case for, especially if you're gonna have a long running process, things like that. The other thing you can do when you have, uh, because we're accepting multiple computer names, um, is you could do something like uh, get dash. I had a text file full of computer names. So this is basically going to force the the parentheses here are going to force get content to run first. Get content is going to get the contents of that file, all the computer names that are in there, and then it's going to feed that into the computer name parameter. And again, since we're accepting an array, it's automatically going to be an array uh, and run against all of them. So it's another shortcut you can do. If you have an Active Directory, you could just as easily do get ad computer things like that. Um, so the last thing we have is uh, is the typical, it's the last thing that every IT person ever does. It's uh, add, adding documentation and logging to their scripts. <laughs> Usually this is the stuff that doesn't actually happen, <laughs> but it's really important. And it actually, it, PowerShell makes it really easy. Um, you can add something called comment, comment based help, uh, which basically makes uh, a help file for your uh, script that looks like the regular PowerShell help. When you do get help against your script, you get a, a full, description, um, uh, examples, uh, you know, context for, you know, who to contact when it's, uh, when it's broken. Um, I recommend putting somebody else's email address in there instead of yours. Um, but basically uh, it's very simple. They have a, a structure you basically put the synopsis, which is kind of the short description, then a larger description, uh, examples, the types of inputs that you're accepting, the types of outputs that you're uh, expecting to output, and then a notes field to put, you know, who wrote it, when it was modified, um, you know, in, in the absence of source control before we were doing source control, this was really like a, a giant change uh, um, log for the script. Um, now with source control, hopefully you're, if you're using source control, that's a better place for those changes to go. Um, but at, at the very least, it gives a place for all of this to, to go. And it gives anybody who's picking up the script for the first time, um, you know, pretty easy uh, access to to a real, essentially a real PowerShell help file. So if you do dash help, you know, and I'm just putting in get help, and I'm putting the uh, script file there. Um, nothing special. I haven't run it, done anything, um, and it's basically going to give me this the standard help, which. Uh, you know, shows uh, the name of the script, uh, the, the, my short description, my the syntax for running it. It automatically is going through there because I said uh, it's reading the parameters and filling this part in here. Um, there's my description that I included. If I do uh, examples, just like a real PowerShell help file, I get the example that I have there. Um, so this is really handy. Uh, you know, for anybody who's picking this up new, uh, this makes it so you don't have to sit down and explain your script to somebody new, right? You basically hand them the script and if they say, oh, how does it work? Is they run get help and it's all there. You know, there's nothing for anybody to figure out. Um, for logging, there's a number of ways to do logging. Um, we've talked about a few of them here in, in previous meetings. Some people have, you know, special scripts and things that they run for logging. Um, at a very basic level, I like to just include a, uh, Write, write verbose commands. Um, you know, again, this is a very basic way to kind of be able to troubleshoot what you're doing, uh, you know, at a very novice level. Um, you can get a lot more complex here. Um, but if you do nothing else, then these write verbose scripts, one, um, this tells me, you know, what's happening here, right? So this, I know that right here, even if I'm not running the script, if I'm just reading this, this is write verbose connecting to computer. So, okay, well, now it's going to try and connect to whatever computer is in the pipeline, right? And you can get really detailed here, like I said. Uh, the only other one I included was, you know, down here at the bottom, this is done with whatever computers in the pipeline. But, you know, if your script is complex, you might do a write verbose that says, you know, uh, querying uh, Win32 computer system. Uh, you know, another one that says querying uh, Win32 BIOS. You know, you can really, in my mind, those take the place of uh, standard comments in a lot of ways because they really, uh, provide the same value and if you word them the same way 
they really can provide the same level of information, but they have the advantage then also of if you run it, if you're trying to figure out where your script is actually failing and you're running it, you can just add the verbose uh, parameter onto your command and it's going to give you all of that as it's going through, right? So connecting to local host. Uh, and then actually the other thing it gives you is these are the verbose statements from uh, get CIM instance. So by default, it's going to tag that dash verbose flag onto the get CIM instance commands as well. Um, so you can really get a good view of what's happening here uh, and where your script is actually airing out when you add that. So that's my quick short talk about how, you know, kind of taking just your two commands, your very basic commands, and trying to turn them into something that's, uh, you know, easy for you to pass around to your team, post for sharing with other people in other, other departments or other, uh, other places. Um, you know, like I said, I think that this, for me, has kind of uh, sort of exemplifies sort of where I started uh, with PowerShell and kind of where it's taken me a very long time to get. Um, so hopefully this, uh, so everybody learned a little something and, and shortcuts, uh, how long it takes you to, to make better scripts and makes you think about the ways that you're making scripts and ways that you can share them. So questions. Cool. Thanks. Thanks everybody. I, uh, I really like the part about the, um, the verbose messages. It, I think people take for granted sometimes all the work that's happening on that. I think it's a good reminder, you know, all the signs of it. Yeah, yeah. I mean, you should see Andrew's scripts just like a page and you can So, for what I do is I do write for both dash for both. So, I don't have a choice. Is <laughs> 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 that turning that off, right? <laughs>